Hi, y'all. Carrie Stevens here from the University of Texas at Austin. I'm pleased to be with you to present our 2020 ICA virtual conference paper around a community wildfire. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. I'm happy to present on behalf of several of my co-authors. Um, I also did this project with Courtney Powers, Lauren Spearing, John Collier, Kendall Titch, and also Brett Robertson. Now, the theoretical background that we used to frame this project really had to do with both resilience and kind of the idea that as communities try to become more resilient, they engage in activities like drills. And so the work of Buzznell and Houston as well as, as well as Dorfel really did inform our theoretical grounding, especially for the research question one that we ask. Now the theory guiding research questions two through four, um, which are more the quantitative portions of this study are the health belief model in particular, we're looking at when self-efficacy was added to the model, as well as trying to transition and use this in a disaster context. And there has been a little bit of work in that area, in particular, some around environmental hazards. And what we've found is that so far, a lot of the research is mixed when they've tried to apply this to a disaster context. Another thing that we thought would be good and prudent in this project is to also use the theory of planned behavior in particular the notion of subjective norms because we're looking at trying to understand more than just an individual's level of preparedness but kind of a collective and a community-wide level as well. So the guiding research question one was how do communication practices and community resilience building efforts work reflexively to inform disaster preparedness Using research questions two through two and three, we are asking specifically about individual level predictors that are derived from these health, health theories and how do they explain disaster preparedness, as well as to what extent do these collective influenced predictors explain disaster preparedness. Our final research question is we were curious about whether or not some of these theoretical perspectives would also guide us in understanding how people are willing to share information. Because if we're gonna try to figure out how to get a lot of people involved and practice drills, there's gonna be a lot of information sharing that goes on. <clears throat> the method we used was predominantly a case study where we did observations, field notes, and interviews. And then we had a questionnaire where we came out on the morning of the fire drill, you'll notice we had to organize out of the back of our car and um, administer paper-based surveys. And the reason we predominantly used paper-based surveys is that this was an older population, as well as the fact that we weren't totally sure about how the Wi-Fi was gonna work um, out in the middle of parking lots uh, in a more rural area. <clears throat> In terms of our field work, our team actually got to get involved and we designed the text message alerts that were sent out to the community members getting ready for the fire drill. Now, this community had actually come up with their own text message alert system. And if you notice right over here, <clears throat> you'll see that we used a lot of the research out there on WIAs, wireless emergency alert systems from both Jeanette Sutton as well as Hamilton Bean to help design good messages in these brief contexts. We had 65 participants who took the survey or who received the alerts, and then 70 of those actually participated in the survey. You'll notice our age range was pretty broad, 19 to 81. Um, not a very demographically diverse group, 84% white and 78% uh, were college graduates, so pretty highly educated group. Our findings from research question one, and this is more kind of our qualitative findings, are that if you look at both Houston's uh, preparedness, communicative preparedness activities, and also Buzznell's, you, we found that almost all of those were present in our existing um, study. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do is we're trying to really conceptualize and we're still working on how to 
bring together the richness of those qualitative findings and then pair them with our quantitative findings, which were research questions two through four. What we found here is that using hierarchical linear uh, regression modeling, that we were able to see that individual level factors, and that means things that you have control over yourself, uh, in particular perceived susceptibility and self-efficacy explain 27% of the variance in our models. Then if we look at subjective norms, and the way that you can kind of think about how we operationalized this was around the notion of social pressure. Um, it added another 9.5% of the variance. And then community association was how many organizations you were a part of in that community. It accounted for another 4.8% of the total variance. And ultimately, you know, we're up, you know, almost at 40% of variance explained. And that is in, is in individuals' intentions to prepare for um, a wildfire in this particular setting. Now, research question four, um, in looking at what predicted people's willingness to share this information, predominantly it's subjective norms. If we feel like other people want us to do it and they put a little pressure on us, we're gonna be more willing to share that information. So ultimately, this study does identify that there are communication and there are also organizing practices that we learn both about and from a community whenever they're able to pull off a successful wildfire preparedness drill. Now, I think it's really important to note here that we're fairly certain that this is the first community-wide effort that has taken place in the US because there were 70 plus people who got into their cars on a Saturday morning and drove out to practice what it was like to go through a wildfire drill. In particular, we also had police and fire and the park rangers who participated in the drill as well. And they coordinated traffic and made sure that people were being diverted. We deliberately planned a diversion halfway through so that it wasn't just exactly what they expected, but we actually rerouted half of our participants halfway through the drill. We also find here that preparedness, it's not just something that individuals do, that the community effort and the influence of others also plays a key role. There's certainly some limitations to this study. We only studied one community and we only included the people who participated in the wildfire drill, not the other people who were part of the community. And this meant that we really got a very limited demographic. However, if we take a look at the demographics that we did capture, they're actually pretty representative of the community as a whole. So contributions and next step. <clears throat> I think that we were able to document and be able to collect data around an actual wildfire drill. And the fact that the community was able to plan it and execute it is a real accomplishment. And our team members were able to be a part of the planning process all the way through the data collection activities. The other thing is this points to the fact that community matters. You know, whenever we know our neighbors, whenever we feel like other people are expecting us to be prepared, increases the likelihood that we will be prepared. And our team is developing a model to try to explain these findings at this time. We hope that we'll have this ready to go for publication uh, this the summer of 2020. So I'd like to end by thanking my incredible team. We had a lot of fun doing this activity. I think we have pictures from us being absolutely exhausted when we finished our work day, but it was very inspirational to work side by side with firefighters, park rangers and police officers and the community who came out, brought their pets with them and actually practiced doing a real wildfire drill. Thank you so much.